So with that, um, thank you all for joining us today, and thank you, Dr. Gavi, for uh, sharing your perspectives and experiences. My pleasure. Okay to start? Okay to start. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Shai Gavi. I'm the System Director of the Hospital Medicine Program across Atlantic Health System. Uh, we have five hospitals, uh, Morristown and Overlook Medical Centers, large academic uh, hospitals uh, from 350 beds to 680 beds, and then three community hospitals um, that range from 50 to uh, 200 bed hospitals. Um, so our strategies has been somewhat uh, individualized based on the site based on the availability of uh, house staff. Uh, specialists differ from site to site. Um, some places uh, very limited critical care, whereas some places we have 24-7 in-house critical care. Um, so I'm happy to speak about how we um, strategized at the small community hospitals and then the large academic medical centers. Um, and I would also kind of say um, this is obviously um, doing this as we're learning. Um, so I'm happy to share our learning lessons and learn from others, and also that the strategies and things that we've been working on and approaching um, this situation is uh, multiple people involved and very much a team effort. Uh, our site directors at each of these sites have been very um, active in putting various strategies together, and this is kind of a compilation of the work that's been done at the individual hospitals. Again, multiple people involved with this. This is, has been a much of a group team effort. So with that said, uh, let me move forward. Um, I've um, kind of looking at about five different um, categories in terms of how we're dealing with COVID-19. So I think one of the challenges for us from a staffing perspective um, in terms of the volumes that we're seeing and how do we make sure that we have enough um, hospitalists. Um, so as soon as this epidemic pandemic initiated, we already knew that we should anticipate people potentially getting sick volumes being a lot higher. So about two weeks, three weeks back, we put together a backup schedule, identified any per diem and locum people that we have and reached out to them and saying, you know, be available. And through working with the CMOs, we're able to get people privileges within one day, emergency privileges. Um, so if you do need people and they're not credentialed, that should not be a barrier given these circumstances. Um, so we're relatively staffed okay, although now with things kind of building up a little more, we're in Northern New Jersey. Um, we've been working on um, at some of our sites, we have certain consultants that have been rounding primarily as a consultant, um, neurology, cardiology, oncology, general surgery, and others. We've uh, reached out to them to do their own primary admission to reduce um, the amount of patients that we're managing on our census. Um, so depending on the hospital, our hospital census can be at 300 at one site, 350, and other sites, it's about 50 patients. Uh, but again, by offloading some of that work, it allows us to pick up additional um, patients that we need to manage. Um, so we've done that phase two. Now we're at phase three, where we're reaching out to the community primary care physicians to see who's able to come into the hospital and help us. Um, whether it's rounds, admitting, et cetera. Um, many of the community primary care physicians, their offices are relatively lighter as far as volume and they have capacity. Um, many of them are a little concerned about coming back into the hospital as they've been out of, they've been out of the hospital for a while now. Uh, but we've created a model where if they do come in to help out, they create, they're working with the hospitalist almost like a buddy buddy rather than alone. And I think they feel comfort knowing that they're going to be working with somebody. Somebody's going to help them rather than coming into a hospital and kind of navigating on their own. Um, and then the, the phase four is that looking at some of our medical specialties, especially ones that recently came out of fellowship that may not be as busy in the office. So endocrinologists, rheumatologists, and others um, to come in and help us in the hospital with general medicine, hospital medicine work as the volumes likely will increase. Our newest priority has been to help support our critical care team. So we have a large critical care uh, group, about 20 um, critical care physicians, 20 intensivists. Um, they're trying to scale up to be able to manage up to 300 vented patients. Um, certainly 20 physicians is not enough. So we're creating what we call pods, where it's one hospitalist 
one critical care physician, and an anesthesiologist managing the care of 24 vented patients. And that's the model that we're putting together to scale up our teams so we can scale up and potentially manage up to 300 vented patients across the system. So in terms of daily work, daily staffing, um, initially we had a few people kind of trained. They were going to be our COVID dedicated hospitalists. Obviously, as the number of cases increased and continued to increase, we realized that um, everybody in the group um, has to be trained and help manage COVID patients. Um, there has been a few exceptions that certain people said, well, they can't because of various reasons, whether it's health reasons, family. In those circumstances, we've asked them to go to occupational medicine and get a waiver from them. We didn't want to take that on. We went to we asked them to go to occupational medicine, so we have a fair process, and that's been working okay. We're trying to keep everyone's census a little lower to 12, 14 patients, recognizing that everybody has several patients, three, four, five, six, seven patients that are COVID. Uh, right now, about 30, 40 percent of our census is COVID patients. Um, and we realize that people need more time um, in terms of the, 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 the putting on the protective equipment, consulting, collaborating with consultants, um, and obviously the physical and the emotional toll it takes. And obviously we have advanced practitioners and they've been very, very helpful in helping us around and see patients as well. And they're in our model. So just in terms of protective equipment, obviously a lot has changed over the prior weeks. Uh, we've done a lot of training video simulation up front um, more and more we're trying to say well how do we make sure we stay safe um, so some of the things people are doing are changing clothes or wearing scrubs to work changing their shoes changing clothes before they go home um, like everywhere and 95s are becoming limited supply um, so at some of the sites and pretty soon all the sites we have a uv light that we're able to um, sanitize the um, n95s so what we're doing is we're putting an N95 on, um, keeping it on for the full day, putting a surgical mask on it, um, again, trying to be innovative to limit the, um, given the limited use of N95. Many people stopped wearing a white coat. They felt that was just another source of potentially droplet attached to the white coat, so they're not wearing white coats. People are showering prior to going home or showering as soon as they go home. Um, over the past week, I would say, it seems like everybody in the hospital now is wearing surgical masks. And um, since there's a lot of community COVID, most of the hospitals feel like any patient they're going to see now, they're wearing a surgical mask, um, irrespective of the reason for the admission. We've also done is trying to limit the physical examinations that we're doing. So if a consultant saw the patient that day, we likely will not see the patient unless clinically indicated. Um, so we will coordinate with the consultant saying, you know, I just saw the patient today and they'll see the following day. So on a given patient, if pulmonary is involved or ID, we may be seeing the patient alternate days rather than daily. Uh, again, trying to limit. So if we have seven or eight COVID patients, you know, we may see two or three of them on a given day, not all seven every day. Uh, we're still figuring out the billing part. We haven't figured that out. Uh, we're working on getting tablets. We just got tablets in so we could do FaceTime. Otherwise, we do call the patients in their rooms. Even if we do see them, we'll call them ahead of time before we come into the room, introduce ourselves, do our review systems, ask questions, whatever we need to, letting them know that we're going to come into the room and examine them, but it's going to be a brief exam, and then that'll be followed up with a phone call a little later for any questions, any anything else that they need. Uh, so we are doing a fair amount of phone calls into the patients' rooms. Um, more recently, we purchased, although we have not received it, um, devices that um, can attach to a stethoscope and you can actually hear remotely. So potentially if um, somebody else is listening to the patient, whether it's a respiratory therapist or even a nurse, you can hear it on your phone through this remote stethoscope. So we've ordered, we haven't received it and we'll try it out. But again, trying to limit exposure. In terms of uh, education and resources, um, we have a lot of emails that goes out um, from the leadership, but we obviously want to make sure we bring it back to our, our hospitalists within our groups. So we try to give a daily update, like this is what's happening, this is how many cases you have, this is what we're doing now. So if a patient needs to get intubated, call anesthesia. You need a central line, call anesthesia. 
Um, so kind of sharing that information as a group, not too close, but trying to have some some time to meet as a group and kind of share some, um, you know, what's working, what's not working, what happened to me, what happened to you, how did you manage the situation? Because again, this is a new environment for everyone. Obviously, SHM has great resources, CDC, and then there's some other things called Lit COVID and Coronavirus Daily, which is a pod, um, which has some information as well. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is we created an order set for COVID suspected cases. So the labs are there, medications that we're going to order are there. Um, we've been working with our palliative care, and they've been very supportive to help us um, be very proactive in code status and goals of care. Uh, obviously, we try to minimize any situation where we're going to have a code. Um, so um, really being very proactive with code status and goals of care. Uh, obviously, discharge barriers, so we're working with an assisted living um, that uh, was recently going to open as a brand new assisted living. They agreed to take on for the near future to be primarily a facility to take COVID positive patients who need rehab. So we're working with that facility locally to have a discharge plan for patients who need physical therapy, et cetera, who are not able to go home because of the physical therapy needs. Um, so that gives us a, a way to discharge because we do find, I'm sure like many others, a lot of patients are coming in, but it's taking um, a significant effort to try to get them discharged. Um, well, obviously like everywhere else, um, look, experiencing some shortages, um, meted dose inhalers, which we've been using as we wanna avoid nebulizers in patients with COVID to avoid the aerosolization. Um, that's running short, um, so we've used some nebulizers with caution, making sure that nobody enters the room for approximately 60 minutes. Um, Plaquenil, azithromycin, um, you know, trying to be um, careful in who we prescribe and who we don't. We work with infectious disease. And obviously now we're realizing there's things like propofol shortage um, and other such medications that we need for patients that are vented. Um, we created a COVID management guideline, the Atlantic Health System did with the pharmacy. Um, and obviously working on the um, ventilator shortage and becoming innovative. Um, most of our hospitals now, essentially, the ICU that was there initially really became now all full of COVID patients that the non-COVID patients have been moved to a different ICU. Um, so, And that's essentially my presentation. And you know, I'm happy to and looking forward to hearing from others. Any thoughts, suggestions, con recommendations? and uh, Again, learning from others during this um, unprecedented uh, time. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Shai. This has been really, um, really helpful. Um, we did have, we do have a few questions. Again, I want to remind folks if you do have a question or even a comment, uh, please type that into the question box, and we'll try to get to as many of those um, as possible in the time we have remaining. Um, so the first question we have is around uh, N95 masks and reusing them and, and the UV light. Um, just could you uh, talk a little bit more about that and uh, the protocol that you all are using and, and sort of how, how that's being managed? So um, essentially what we've been told is that if you have an N95, because a limited supply, to use the N95 mask, when you come out of the room, put it in a brown paper bag not a plastic bag, but specifically a brown paper bag with your name on it, and to keep it outside that patient's, patient's room. Um, and what they're able to do at the end of the day is take that N95, the one that you used, um, and put it on the UV light for an hour, which essentially sterilizes the N95 that you can use it the following day again. Now, that's only if you're going to see one patient. Um, which is a challenge because many of us now have multiple patients. Um, so what we started doing is putting on a 95 with a surgical mask over it, going to see one patient, coming out of the room, taking off that the surgical mask, putting on another surgical mask, going to see another patient, keeping that N95 on. And then when we finish seeing all the, all the patients, um, where they're using that N95 and just getting rid of it, uh, because we don't have the UV light at all the sites, but the sites that have the N95, putting it in a paper bag and getting it sterilized. 
So that's how we're doing it. Great, thank you. Another question came in around um, discharging patients and particularly discharging COVID positive patients. Um, have you done any discharges or are you contemplating any discharges to places like hotels to do um, what the questioner referred to as quarantine lodging to help break the cycle of community transmission? So we are discharging patients. Um, we created a standardized discharge instruction sheet for patients that we're giving, which essentially requires people to quarantine themselves for at least seven days after they have not had any symptoms, uh, and a febrile for three days. So we, we use the CDC recommendations, but we did create um, standardized discharge instructions that are being printed out automatically by nurses on all patients that are COVID positive that are going home. We'll obviously send them out with prescriptions for Plaquenil or Azithromycin, whatever we've been treating them. Um, the challenge we'd have is some of them, when they went to get discharged, they are not able to get the Plaquenil at local pharmacies because local pharmacies ran out. Uh, so we've had some patients come back to the ER um, asking what to do. Um, so that's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, but we're definitely discharging patients with recommendations to stay home. Uh, quarantine themselves, even if they live with other family members, to kind of isolate themselves and wear a mask if they need to. Uh, but we definitely send people home. We have to because we can't keep them here. The capacity doesn't allow it. There's another question around um, the the shift and have you adjusted? And I'm not sure what your your normal was, and I suspect maybe there are some differences across the site given the variability at Atlantic Health System. Um, but what kind of shift hours are the hospitals working? Are, are, are they 10 to 12 hour shifts? Are you doing flexible four to six hour shifts? Have you, have you changed scheduling in any meaningful way? So actually it's a very good question. So um, particularly at the large academic medical centers, many of the physicians previously were working more of a Monday to Friday. More, many of them were in a teaching capacity. Uh, the teaching and the teaching teams, the resident teams, have not fully dissolved, but to a significant degree have decreased in size. Um, but many of the hospitalists who are working primarily Monday to Friday, they've changed more to a 12-hour workday, shift seven on, seven off, or five on, five, you know, something along those lines. So we have changed many of the people to a 12-hour shift, recognizing that we need a longer day to be in the hospital. It takes more time and people are, um, are not able to kind of round and leave by five o'clock that we need to kind of allow them for more time throughout the day. So um, many of our hospitalists are already work seven on, seven off, or five on, five off, 12 hour shifts, but the ones that were, were more Monday to Friday, academic models have shifted to that model as well because they're working independent now without residents and that required us to change their um, sh schedule. And I, I found interesting, um, one of the questions, and this would be a question from staff, um, that, that we've had and we've seen from, from members is how to incorporate um, some of these outpatient primary care doctors into your practice. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the buddy system that you're using? So we actually haven't officially started it, but as we um, start speaking with the primary care physicians, um, there's been discussions of comfort level, what resources should they kind of read to kind of catch on. So we've kind of discussed that a little bit, but I think the point is that what we've instructed them is when they come on, you know, we'll essentially have them maybe buddy up with two hospitalists and they'll take, you know, three patients from my list, take two or three patients from your list, and then this way they have somebody to kind of work with um, how to call a consult, how to navigate certain things, because I think they do find it intimidating if they kind of own the patients on their own, if they're not familiar with the hospital environment and they haven't done it for a while. So it's really just to have a support and they know they have somebody nearby in case they need help, in case the patient is deteriorating and they need somebody you know, to help so they know they're not alone. So we haven't really officially started it yet, but we've, that's the model that we're presenting that they would partner with somebody and work as a partnership rather than be fully alone with the list of patients on their own, which can be a little intimidating if you haven't been in the hospital in a while. 
<laughs> Great, yeah, I, I think it certainly seems to, to make sense, um, uh, at least in concept. We'll certainly be curious to hear um, how it works um, in practice. Um, another question for you. Uh, someone had a comment about uh, one of the notes you made about uh, not entering rooms for 60 minutes after NEB. Um, and uh, they indicated that they've been told that COVID-19 lasts for three hours in the air. So I, I guess if you have any thoughts or additional comments about, um, about that policy that you have um, uh, for 60 minutes. Uh, oh, it's a great you have yeah. any comments. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great point. And I should just, I guess, clarify is that 60 minutes with someone that someone said was realistic. Uh, we knew it wasn't ideal, but we knew we could not come into the room for three hours. Um, and, um, you know, they thought if they're running an N95, and again, if we're really, really short and don't have many options, you know, we would limit. Uh, the other thing they spoke about regards to that is they would potentially put a surgical mask on the nebulizer. Um, they would also have the nebulizer sometimes with the mouthpiece, so it's not as aerosolized. Um, so I guess I would say don't take the 60 minutes as a rule. It was 60 minutes in the context of if this is the last thing we have, we had no other options, and if we could do some other things to mitigate the risk, like putting a surgical mask over the nebulizer or using a mouthpiece, um, other strategies to minimize the aerosolization. Um, so you're 100% right. Three hours is what people are thinking, up to three hours. And um, 60 minutes was something that we thought would be practical um, because certainly not to go into room three hours would be almost impossible. Sure. Uh, a follow-up question about uh, nebulizers. Are you using nebs for your COVID negative patients still? Yes. Yes. Yes, definitely. I mean, we're trying to preserve the MDI inhalers for the COVID positive. Um, so we're, we are using uh, NEBS for the COVID negative. And then uh, related to COVID negative patients, how are you treating negative results? Um, are, are you comfortable with them and, uh, and removing precautions or are you retesting? How are you managing um, uh, do you, does your team find yeah. the negative uh, COVID right. test great to be? Yeah. Um, great question. So, you know, I think uh, what we're finding is a couple of things. One is that we're having a lot, of, not a lot, but a significant number of patients that people are getting a COVID test on, that the pre-test likelihood is pretty low, that they're not likely to be positive. Um, I just had a patient that we admitted that um, essentially came in from a nursing home, tachycardic, et cetera, but had good reasons to be tachycardic, more gastrointestinal uh, necessarily than our respiratory, no fevers. Um, Pre-test probability of COVID positive is very low, although we're ruling it out. Um, but then we have other patients that the pre-test probability is very high. Uh, they're lymphopenic. They obviously have uh, chest X-ray findings that are very suggestive of COVID. So in those kind of patients, a negative COVID is not going to exclude COVID. And um, we have had um, one patient already that we had a negative test on that we all felt that was uh, very suspicious to be COVID and treated it as a positive, despite the negative test. Great. It, it, yeah, it sounds like it's uh, constantly fluid and changing uh, situation. Yeah. So um, if uh, that's all of the questions that we've received, if anyone has any uh, questions uh, still, um, I'll ask another question in the interim uh, just around uh, managing staffing. You, you mentioned uh, there may be some of uh, your staff who've uh, indicated that they um, didn't feel comfortable for whatever reason um, in terms of caring for COVID patients. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you arrived at that process of um, encouraging folks to go to occupational health um, to sort of clear folks? Yeah. Was that, was so that really, really just to kind of, go ahead. 
Yeah, it's really more, so it was more from a administrative um, direction that if individuals felt that they're not able to take care of patients with COVID, that they go through occupational health, occupational medicine, and they would go through a strategy to identify if this person is really excused or not from taking care of COVID patients. Not that we had many, but I will say, I mean, some of the things that have come up in discussions, you know, individuals that are pregnant, uh, people that have spouses at home that may be immunocompromised, or people may actually have, you know, a, an infant at home that was, you know, maybe a month or two old. Um, so, you know, I mean, things that seem very reasonable, um, but it's hard to make decisions because everybody can have something why they may fear taking care of a certain patient population. But uh, our administration has directed us to work with OMS to have a standardized approach. And that's what we've done. And have you been have you been using the same approach for um, maybe some of your older staff members? Have, have they been uh, sort of going through occupational health if if they feel like they're at high risk, or how how are you managing? If that's come up, how are you managing? So that? I mean, it it has not come up. I mean, um, it has not come up. We don't have anybody that would be particularly you know in that age group in our group that would be really concerned. Um, but um, we have about 80 hospitalists across our system. Um, but, you know, again, we would follow the same path where we would ask them to, you know, if they had concerns. Um, that said, I mean, we have multiple physicians within all the organizations um, that are, you know, various age groups that are still rounding and seeing patients. Um, and age, for the most part, um, has, no one has really claimed to say, you know, I'm not going to mount any patient. Actually, I, I take it back. We do have someone who's older um, and no issues. Okay. Uh, so going back to the question about um, uh, testing patients, uh, if you have negative COVID tests for patients, but they're high probability, are, are you... Are you all retesting those patients, or how are you managing that? So we haven't had many to really tell you how we've been doing it. Um, I would say that we would probably would retest to make sure, you know, maybe giving it a few days and then retesting it, but obviously treating the patient even initially, even with a negative, if the pretest probability was pretty high. I mean, we are finding that the X-ray and CAT scan, CAT scan findings are very specific to COVID. Um, so they are very suggestive in people, you know, in, despite the testing results. So, so we would be test, I would say, but we're still going to treat. Okay. Uh, we had a couple of questions just uh, come in around um, your providers. Uh, so whether you've had any staff members who've uh, become infected with uh, coronavirus, um, if you have, uh, you know, how many staff have you, like what percentage of your staff um, uh, have you had that face? Do you have plans in place if you have a certain percentage of staff who have to be out? Um, yeah. And then a, a more detailed question kind of to tack on to that is um, if a, a patient who's not been tested at the beginning of a hospitalization but develops symptoms later in the hospitalization and needs to be tested, um, how are you managing those healthcare providers who might have seen, have seen that patient earlier in the hospitalization? So um, I think the first question, we do have one hospitalist who a few days back, um, symptomatic and positive COVID, um, whether it was work-related or just outside home-related, we don't know. Um, that person is going to be out uh, 7 to 14 days. Um, again, we send them to occupational medicine. They deal with that, but it's usually 7 to 14 days, depending on set of symptoms, um, and they would have to get cleared to come back to work. Um, so, again, occupational medicine um, would address that. Um, and then if someone... Um, in the, and we had cases where after the fact, three days later, um, someone said, this might have been COVID, can we test? And we had that, and it came back positive. So 
so what we did in those circumstances were um, we actually collected the names of the people that might have been involved with the care. We looked through the computer to see who was logged in, who wrote notes. Uh, our infection control person would contact them and say, um, this person tested positive on the 23rd. You were involved in the care of this patient. You know, these days, based on the notes in the chart that we can see you saw the patient. Um, so the recommendations have been to check the temperature twice a day and to wear a mask in the hospital. Um, and obviously to notify an uh, occupational medicine if they have a fever, occupational health. So essentially, um, that was the protocol is to um, wear a mask and check temperatures twice daily. Incidentally, all of our hospitals started yesterday checking temperatures of all people coming into the building. So everybody has the temperature checked as soon as we enter the building. And I'm sure like many hospitals now, there's strict no visiting allowed, no visitors. Right. The, you mentioned that one of the challenges um, on discharging patients have been that patients weren't able to fill the placanil. Yeah. Uh, how, and, and that some patients have returned to the ER as a result. Is that, how, is there any, how, have you come up with any strategies to mitigate that um, from happening in the future or how are you managing that issue with discharge? So it's a relatively new problem that just in the past uh, couple of days, I think what our strategy is going to do is when we discharge a patient, we are doing it electronically and maybe having the unit clerk or even having the patient call the pharmacy and make sure that it's filled before they leave the hospital. Um, and I think that's this way, if they can identify that it's not filled, we can find another pharmacy. Um, but you know, I think making sure that it's filled before they leave the hospital, because um, we are doing it electronically so the pharmacy will get the prescription. And another question about discharges, um, have your, uh, working with nursing homes, um, have they either been hit by the virus and, and so therefore aren't uh, really able to accept patients, but how have you been managing discharge to, to other facilities like nursing homes? Right. So we initially, there was a little bit of um, discussions with the nursing home. The nursing homes have asked us to get repeat tests that are negative before we send the patients back. Our administration was very active in speaking with the nursing homes and saying that we cannot do that. That it will fill up with too many patients too fast to try to get negative tests on people to send them back to a facility, uh, back to the nursing homes that they came from. So what we're doing is sending them back once they're medically stable and asking the nursing homes to keep the patients on droplet precautions in a private room with a closed door. Um, under droplet precautions. So we are sending them back uh, if they're medically stable, um, just as if they were going home, uh, because we explained that we cannot keep them here and repeat testing and get negative tests. We'll never be able to discharge patients and we don't have the room to do that. Um, right. So that's what we've been doing. Uh, so this, unfortunately, will have to be the last question, um, but have you looked at a backup call or paid on-call system? If so, how are you operationalizing it? So we created a backup call schedule, although um, it has not been a paid, it's been a backup call. Um, so far, we haven't had to use it, um, and um, we'll see, but um, we, ha we did create a backup score, and people seemed okay with it. But um, we we don't we don't pay people to take backup calls. 